This is my story and the beginning of yours. Who am I? What is happening to me? It's been such a long time. I've forgotten my past. For seven million years, I was hidden in the sand. These humans are trying to help me remember, to reconstruct my face, my body, the place I was born. There was a place with trees and water. I see glimpses of the past. Danger. My family. What happened? I know my name is Tumai, and I am your new ancestor. This is my story, and the beginning of yours. Seven million years. It's hard to imagine. I come from 230,000 generations before you. What really happened? I lived with my group. Other males, females, little ones. But danger was ever present. At any moment, death could leap out and snatch us. Sabretooth always attacked the weakest. I wanted to protect the others, distract the beast, give them time to get away. I could have disappeared from the face of the earth forever. The ground swallowed me up. I became a fossil. For nearly seven million years I was forgotten, and I forgot all about my past. And then they found me. They didn't expect to find me here. For 30 years the world scientists believed that mankind originated in the east of Africa. I, Tumai, come from west of the Great Rift Valley, from the Jurab Desert of northern Chad. These are the humans who found me, paleontologists from Chad and from France. They believe I am part of the skull of a hominid, a cranium nearly seven million years old. If it is true, it will turn the previous theories about the origin of man upside down. This is Professor Michel Brunet, he has long suspected that the theories of the origin of man are incorrect. Twenty years ago, he set out to explore west of the African Rift Valley. Michel and his team discovered the first hominid fossil in Central Africa, the jaw of an Australopithecine. He is named Abel, and he is three and a half million years old. Then in 2001, they found me, Tumai. I could be the oldest known ancestor of mankind. The first human being I ever set eyes on was our Junta Jim Dumulbai, one of the Chadian scientists in Michel's team. When I dug it out, I turned it over and over just looking at it. 
but I still didn't realize what it was. Then when I turned it this way up, I saw the two eye sockets and the nasal cavity. My heart instantly started beating faster. For that moment, I was by myself, and for just 15 minutes I was alone with the skull. I scraped it off, and there we had what we'd been looking for. I said, look, it's a hominid, look at that. How can he be so sure I'm a hominid? What is a hominid? They called me Tumai, which means hope of life in the local Goran language. I picked up the phone and he said, David, we've got it. Is a messenger from the very deep past. The origin of mankind has been pushed twice as far back in time. Some scientists held to the previous theories. They doubted that I was the skull of a hominid. Michel Brunet has set out to prove that I am. First stop, the synchrotron, an extraordinary machine which generates an X-ray beam 1,000 billion times brighter than conventional X-rays. It's like a scanner and can produce the precise images of me Michel needs. There is a problem, you see. I am an almost complete skull, except that my lower jaw is missing. But I've been squashed down one side and bits of the ground have stuck to me. The first step in determining what I am is to restore my true shape and to work out what is really part of me and what isn't. What's to my and what's not to my. The engineer points out my canine, my two premolars, and the three molars. He seems to find it interesting that each of the two premolars has three root canals. Which is, of course, a primitive feature inherited from the common ancestor shared by both chimpanzees and humans. So does that mean I'm a bit like both? Second step. The professor asked another group of specialists to make a virtual reconstruction of me. They loaded 500 pictures of me into their computers. From these pictures, they start to build an image in three dimensions which corrects my distortions. The two scientists each worked separately and each made two independent reconstructions using different methods. In the end, they created four models. We are now comparing our two independent reconstructions to see if we converge or differ. Now Michel can study the results. The four models are strikingly similar. In particular, they make it possible to determine precisely how far the flat plane at the back of my cranium, what they call the nuchal plane, was inclined backwards. Apparently, hominids and great apes differ in this respect. So this is an important clue. They compare me to the great apes. That's me in the middle. Their analysis supports the idea that I am a hominid. The computer image is turned into a resin cast using a machine they call a laser stereolithograph. The virtual reconstruction becomes real, solid. It's a strange sensation to see my own face appear, gradually emerging from this time machine. So this is what my proper shape is. The next step in rebuilding my head is a visit to Elizabeth Daines workshop. She will add muscles and skin to the resin cast of me using forensic science techniques to determine how the muscles should go. Only a few specialists in the world know how to do this. And I'm glad to be in Elizabeth's expert hands.
Regarde, quand tu le regardes de dos. Enfin, de dos, en face occipital. It looks like we might be here for some time. I can't wait to see what I really looked like. seems to be coming along nicely now. <laughs> Professor Brunet watches over every stage and checks that each minute detail is scientifically accurate. <laughs> the aim is to have a more pointed canine, one that would be uh, a bit longer than the others. Of course, putting the eyes in brings the sculpture to life. That doesn't look bad. Is that really what I looked like? <laughs> for paleontologists, for anthropologists, this is the image we have of Tumai. That it may be close to the reality, but we don't know. Because we don't know about his hair, his eyes or his nose. But uh, if we had the chance to bump into Tumai, as we were leaving your studio, maybe we would find that he wasn't so very different from that. Maybe not. Scientists never seem to agree about anything. So before going any further, Michel wants to test what he has discovered on another expert. We set off to see David Apology at the University of Harvard. You remember this one? Monsieur Tumai. Hello, Mr. Pillbeam. He's a little bit crushed and a little bit distorted. <laughs> Beautiful specimen. But Beautiful you specimen. have never seen this one. And the professor shows him the 3D model of me in resin. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Ah, this is what Zoli did? Yeah. And Marcia? Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, good work. A good biped, I think. It's a big surprise. And yeah. these still these enormous brow ridges. Yeah. yeah. Clearly a male. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, Clearly yeah. a male. If this is yeah. a female, oh, I, w I wouldn't want wouldn't want to meet the male on a dark well, night. Well of course I'm a male. Uh, I could have told them that. This? Yeah. Something completely new. And handsome when we are looking at him now we are looking at the earliest face yeah. Yeah. of humanity I like his face yeah. Yeah. the more you look <laughs> at it the more you can easily imagine that he's alive you can easily imagine he's alive, yes. 
and I do find myself starting to imagine what my life might have been like. Did my body look something like this, perhaps? And what kind of world did I live in? There are a lot of things I need to know. What can I eat? Where can I hide? What are these creatures? Who is friend? And who is foe? I don't know. There are some things here that don't seem right. By letting my imagination run wild, I'm getting ahead of myself. There are many things Michelle still doesn't know about me, and that we're both impatient to find out. Having got this far, I'm embarrassed to ask, but what is a hominid when you get down to it? What makes a hominid different from an ape? Apparently, hominids have small canines and walk upright on two feet. When most animals walk, all primates, they hold their heads so that the eyes are looking forward. In addition, the frame and magnum, this hole, is pretty much always perpendicular to the orientation of the neck. It can only move about 10 degrees. Mm. So if you put Tumai's head on a chimpanzee's body, its eyes would always be pointing downwards. It would have to crane its neck to look forward. But of course, if you put Tumai on a human's neck, because of the orientation of the frame and magnum, its eyes look forward. Mm. It has to be a biped. If you draw a line across the opening where my spine meets my head and another up to my eye sockets, the angle formed is larger than a right angle, as in you humans. But what other hominid characteristics do I have that could show once and for all, beyond any shadow of a doubt, that I am not an ape? The two professors sit themselves down in a room with a lot of different skulls. Great apes, chimpanzees and gorillas, and hominids. They talk a long time, but this is the gist of it. Small canine? My upper canine is small in size. It's worn down at the point in the same way your human canines tend to do. My face is shorter and flatter than those of the great apes, and my brow ridge, which Mr. Pillbeam has so admired, is very pronounced. Lastly, there is the backward tilt of my nuchal plane. They don't look like African apes. We must be quite close to the split of chimps and humans, surely. Michelle and David conclude that there can no longer be any doubt. I really am a hominid. But I don't understand how they can be sure I'm so old. Time for another expedition. Michel sets off to look for more fossils. For the 11th year in a row, his caravan returns to the Jurab Desert in northern Chad. For me, it's a chance to revisit the place where I was born.
The jeeps stop at Salal, the last village outpost on the edge of the vast, empty Durab. It's our last chance to stock up on supplies of water and petrol. For the humans, these supplies are vital, otherwise they won't be able to survive the desert environment. They say it's too hostile. And we're off. And we've stopped. I suppose Michelle doesn't have the same impatience as I do. It takes us three whole days to reach our destination. As soon as they wake in the morning, Michelle examines me once more, along with the Chadian paleontologists, Makai Taisu and Likia Sandosa. They have been important members of the expedition team for 10 years, and the fossils found here will be delivered into their care. They're going to start looking near where they found me. If they find more fossils, these will give more clues about my past, about my age. Most importantly, they say they're hoping to find the remains of other hominids, other tumais. For each fragment of hominid we find, we find thousands of animal fragments. Oh, so there's not much chance of them finding any other tumais then. In fact, I'm amazed they can find anything at all, with the sand and the wind whirling constantly around us. To find hominids, you have to look for them. To begin with, you have to look in the right place, and then sooner or later you find one. Often the part that takes the most time is finding the right place. My team and I have already done that, so the hardest bit's over. If you find one, you can find others. It's like looking for mushrooms. I couldn't share in Michel's optimism. They can hardly see their hands in front of their faces, let alone find something small in the sand. But then I heard them say that the wind can actually help by exposing fossils which have been completely hidden in previous years. I notice that they only find the odd little fragment. So it really is rare and exceptional to find a fossil like me. A skull which is almost whole. This is the type of piece we can pick up here in rough weather. It's around 10 centimeters long. That's the upper jaw of a large antelope. Here, by way of comparison, we have the lower jaw, the right-hand side, of a hominid which was found next to Tumai. It's not the same individual. Tumai has a new upper wisdom tooth. Here the wisdom tooth is very worn. And we have other remains, which mean that within a very small perimeter, only a few dozen square meters, there are fragments belonging to at least six different individuals. That means that here, for the first time, we must have the remains of the first pre-human family. So there are other two mice. But where? So there are other two mice. But where? Obviously, that's not them. Other two mice? And Michel thinks that we might have known each other, that we might have been like a family. I wonder what it would have been like. Could it be them? I think they do look like me. That one's not quite the same, though. What should I do? Should I let them see me? Or maybe better not? Too late. I am 
understand now. The smaller one is a female. Yes, she's definitely different. With much regret, I'm forced to leave my daydream and come back to Earth. The searchers in the desert have made some finds. But that's the thing. Apparently, it wasn't a desert when I lived here. This is what Philippe de Ranger has found out. Philippe is a geologist. He has discovered traces of plant life and is working out how the climate evolved long ago. He has concluded that this area was in fact once a lakeside and probably resembled a place called the Orcavango. The Okavango River has this peculiar characteristic. It never flows into a sea or an ocean. In Botswana, its waters spread out over the sandy plains of the Kalahari Desert and form a vast delta. It is made up of a succession of shallow lakes, watercourses lined with forest and wooded savanna. Michelle and I travel to the Okavango to find out whether it does resemble the place I used to live. By studying the right type of habitat and the creatures in it, Michelle can judge more clearly how I lived, what I ate, what threats there were to my survival. Guides who know the area well are going to help us find what we are looking for. Many scientists believe that the early hominids started to walk upright because their habitat had changed. Instead of living in forests, they were adapting to the open savanna. Michel thinks that the story is more complicated and that I lived in a wooded environment. But can we find an environment like that? One which would give me protection and provide me with the right types of food? This is certainly a pleasant place, though I'm not sure all the locals are friendly. Oh, that's better. Back to civilization. This is Professor Jaeger, and he's borrowed me for a while to have a look at my teeth. That's one of the most important features of this canine. It is nearly flat on the side that's used. So it clearly didn't operate at all like the tooth of a great ape, of an orangutan, a chimp, or a gorilla. The way Tomai's teeth are worn down shows that they must have been used to a considerable extent for crushing and grinding. So even the kind of teeth I have show that I am not an ape. Professor Jaeger takes a tiny sample of enamel from my teeth. When acid is added, carbon dioxide will be released. The carbon component has been locked up for millions of years. From this, he will be able to find out more about what food I ate. He discovered that I ate all sorts of things. Fruit, nuts, new leaves, young shoots, termites, roots, tubers. Food which came from a wooded environment. But having a varied diet is easier said than done. It is, as you might say, a tough nut to crack.
Given what I can see around me now in the Okavango, it can't have been that easy to find food. When there was nothing left to eat in our patch of woodland, we would have had to cross the savanna to reach a forest where we could forage a bit more. But that meant taking a terrible risk. Out there, there's no shelter, and there may be predators about. Now we know what Tumai ate. But what ate Tumai? Why are the birds flying around in circles? What does that mean? so hungry and we can't bring down large animals ourselves. We have to take advantage of any food we can get. When we were in Chad, I saw the others find enormous bones, and I think they might have come from the same animals. Michelle says some of the bones belong to ancestors of the creatures we see today in the Okavango. That's a rather primitive species of elephant we call Anancus. You don't find very many. That's rather an important specimen because it will give us a reference point. So that's a Euthecodon mandible, a crocodile already identified at a lot of African sites, and which we know existed between about 9 million years ago and 2 million years ago. But these fragments are important because they show that there were not only backwaters or swamps here, but also running water with lots of fish, lots of potential prey species. After taking them out of the ground, the scientists protect the best animal fossils from my era in plaster. They are very important for determining my age. That's how we came to the evaluation of Tumai's age as being around 7 million years. Brunei knew we would find a hominid, and I knew that if we found one, he would be old. 7 million years. That means I'm the earliest hominid known so far. I must say, I don't feel that old. Ah, oui. 
It's the humerus of a machaerodont, those big cats with upper canines like sabers. It's much bigger than a tiger. That's a beast which weighed over 400 kilograms at least. He was the boss around here. Back in the Okavango, Michel is still trying to identify some prime hominid habitat, a place where I and those like me could have thrived and raised healthy offspring. Not so bad. And I guess if the vervet monkeys can live here, then so could two mine. It's a nice way. At the time, it's a nice place for baboon. Yeah. yeah. Palm trees. So they have a lot. Mm. Not in a very small place. So it's not so bad. Yes, this does look like a lovely place. Now I can really let my imagination run wild. I know life could not always have been easy, but there must have been some nice times. The scientists believe we may have lived in groups similar to those of chimpanzees. Groups of at least six members, both females and males, headed by a dominant male. <coughs> Michel only knew what goes on in my mind. I like this story. Now I'm head of the group, and it seems that soon I might have some descendants. Michel never leaves me in peace for a moment. We're back on the road again, and sometimes I'm forced to travel in the most terrible conditions. But then I'm a scientific phenomenon, and lots of people want to see me. Until Michel's team found Abel, and then me, all the great hominid fossil discoveries took place in the east of Africa. There they found fossils which are just a little younger than me. At least, only a million years or so younger. There was Aurorin in Kenya and there were several Ardipithecus finds in Ethiopia. Many of these important hominid fossils are held here at the National Museum of Ethiopia. I understand that Michel wants to introduce me to one of them, Ardipithecus cadaba. He's 5.8 million years old, the most ancient hominid fossil of Ethiopia. I think the secret aim of this journey is to see if we might be somehow related. And the interesting thing is that the one from Chad... That's Professor Tim White of the University of California, a world expert in human evolution. The two scientists are joined by Dr. Johannes Haile Selassie, who discovered Ardipithecus cadaver. 
Professor White compares the teeth of Ardipithecus with those of my species and notes that we both have a very similar jaw structure. Which are from the same uh, horizon. He even goes so far as to say that I could be the ancestor of Ardipithecus. This could be a vital clue, implying that hominids may have gradually migrated from West to East Africa. But Michel seems to have some reservations. For me, it's too early to answer. I have not enough. You have not enough. We have not enough. It's too early. The scientists have a new surprise for me. They're going to introduce me to another important figure. Ici, Erto. 155 to 160,000 years old. The earliest Homo sapiens the direct ancestor of modern humans. So we have, in terms of our understanding of human evolution now, we have an understanding at the beginning and at the end of the story. That's a wonderful moment to have us on the same table, the earliest sapiens and the earliest hominid. We have not only these endpoints, mm -hmm. but we have literally thousands of fossils in the middle. Yeah. Like this one from the Lucy species, mm -hmm. a jaw that is incontrovertibly not an ape and also not a human. No. It is something in between. To my is obviously not a human being. A human ancestor, yes. Yeah. Because we know the features of its face, particularly its teeth, mm. its basic cranium. It looks like it's on our evolutionary line, but right near the base of the line that would ultimately lead to things like hair toe in yeah. Ethiopia. Yeah. While in Addis Ababa, Michel pays a visit to someone important, Lucy. A small female Australopithecus discovered 30 years ago. For many years, she was the oldest known ancestor of mankind. Now, all that has changed. For Michel, Lucy is an important symbol. Because she is situated halfway between you and me on the evolutionary scale. Since she is 3.2 million years old, she is, in fact, slightly closer to you than she is to me. I'm a hominid. Official name, Sahelanthropus chadensis, alias Tumai. I'm nearly 7 million years old, a new species of pre-human being. The closest known to the split between chimpanzees and humans. I am mankind's new ancestor. Today there is a new being in the world, a miniature one, a baby to mine. ancestor of mankind. So did Lucy and all the Australopithecines descend from me or from a creature like me? After 350,000 generations did we give birth to you, Homo sapiens. Did my kind, seven million years ago, have any consciousness of what we were? Of all the wise people I've met, 
None has been able to answer this question. I wanted to save them. I tried to distract the beast, to give them time to get away. I started to run as fast as I could. My name is Tumai. I am your new ancestor. This is the end of my story and the beginning of yours. <laughs>